All right, so uh, thanks everybody. Uh, I, I wanted to, or I was asked to give an update on what's going on with um, Aries and uh, Oxcom, and you may or may not know what Oxcom is, you will, but by the time I'm done. Um, a lot has happened since the last time I presented on this, which was, I think, pre-pandemic, probably. Um, the uh, We've got new leadership in the uh, in the Virginia section, and uh, and they're actually making stuff happen. Uh, very exciting, and uh, and we've got uh, a new statewide interoperability coordinator who many of us know really well, Gabe Elias, who used to run all of the communications and computing systems for our local uh, first responders, and he's now working for VDEM uh, in in charge of interoperability all across the state, and. Um, I, I like to think that we did a pretty good job and, and trained him. He's a big fan of ham radio and, uh, and a real advocate for us. So things are happening uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, what's not happening is uh, slides change. Yeah, sometimes you have to click on it. Because once you switched over to Zoom, it, it wants to, they, once you click on it on, on the PowerPoint, it should go. There we go. All right, so you've heard me harp on a couple of things. I'm not gonna go uh, way deep on this. Amateur radio is a hobby, emergency communications is not. And unfortunately, a lot of people treat Aries as a hobby. And uh, uh, and I made it clear when I took over as EC that that wasn't the way I saw it. And um, there were 50 people on the Aries roster when I took over and there are seven now. Uh, but those seven people are committed and dedicated and have uh, really put a lot of energy and creativity into, into making things happen around here. Uh, the other thing that I've always said, when all else fails, is too late. Uh, the world of emergency communications is not the world of 50 years ago, and we can't just show up with our two meter handhelds and expect to be useful. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff we need to get ready for. So. Uh, Back in the uh, 1970s, after some particularly bad fire seasons, the folks in, in the uh, West, particularly California, came up with this thing called the Incident Command System. They had uh, multiple agencies responding to, uh, to fires, to wildfires, and, uh, and they weren't well coordinated and people were dying and a lot of property was being destroyed because of coordination issues. So they came up with this thing called the Incident Command System. Uh, after 9-11, by uh, presidential direction, the National Incident Management System was created, and that incorporated ICS plus a bunch of other stuff into a scalable national framework for responding to incidents. And in fact, uh, uh, most organizations that use ICS use it for uh, routine stuff as well. So all of the football games at UVA are run uh, under an ICS structure because it's great practice and you have many of the same uh, challenges. So uh, because uh, the feds uh, made adoption of ICS a condition for federal funding, everybody does it, uh, including our local folks here. So uh, NIMS and ICS, uh, there, there's a set of 14 principles. I'm not gonna go through them one at a time, but there's some really, key things. Uh, one key thing is everybody uses the same terminology the same way. If you say incident commander, everybody knows what that means. If you say logistics chief, everybody knows what that means. Uh, it's all plain language. No, uh, uh, no 10 codes or uh, we've got a 457 that such and such. All plain language so you don't have to worry about people not understanding each other's codes. Uh, it is uh, modular and expandable. So you can start with ICS. In theory, every interaction between every, every incident that a, a public safety organization responds to is run under ICS. The, the, the cop in the patrol car might be the only police officer on the scene. He's incident commander or she's incident commander, but it's, IC, it's running under ICS. And if it gets bigger, if it turns out that that simple call wasn't so simple, and now they've got 10 cops on the scene, 
he's still incident commander. It's still some, until there's a, a handover of command. So everybody knows who's in charge. Everybody knows what the uh, uh, what the uh, pecking order is, who they take orders from. Um, span of control is a, another biggie. Uh, there's been a lot of research that shows that somebody can't, one person can't supervise more than about seven people. Uh, so something between five and seven is the optimal number. So uh, everything's organized around that. Um, unified command. Uh, there have been a lot of incidents in which you had uh, the fire chief and the police chief and the mayor and three or four other officials all claiming they were in charge. Uh, there's a, a procedure in ICS for figuring for determining who's in charge and designating that person making it clear. It uses a very military chain of command. So everybody works for one and only one person and you don't take orders from anybody else. Uh, and that, uh, that deals with a, a whole lot of confusion and I'm not gonna go into the rest of them. So uh, there's this org chart. You, you don't do this for every incident. Like I say, uh, you stand up the pieces of the structure that you need for that particular incident. So you might well have uh, a, a simple incident uh, like um, a fire. Uh, you've got a small fire, house fire, uh, two engines respond, uh, deputy fire chief responds, the deputy fire chief's probably incident commander. Uh, there are a couple of uh, strike groups, firefighters who are fighting the fire, and that's really about all you need. But if it starts to get bigger, let's say the fire jumps to the next house, and now the fire jumps to another house down the block and this thing's getting big. Now we've got multiple fire companies. Maybe we're calling in mutual aid from outside the, the area and this can grow very quickly to accommodate much, much bigger incidents. Uh, so that's the boring bureaucratic part. Uh, where do we fit? The communications unit comes under logistics not operations. I was surprised at first, but it's not. It comes under logistics, uh, which is where all of the services that support operations uh, live. So the operations section is the people who are on the front line battling the problem, whatever the problem is, and everybody else is in one of the other uh, sections. So we're in the communications unit specifically my screen share isn't working, right? Sorry. So specifically, we're down here. Oxcom is this A-U-X-C-O-M-M, -M, uh, stands for Auxiliary Communications. It's this new term that was coined to, to give people like us and like React and uh, the Saturn folks, the Salvation Army radio folks, and all of the other com volunteer communication org organizations that get pulled into disasters to give us a place to live in ICS. And this is in the process of rolling out. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, but that that's where we live. So we work for the communications unit leader through, depending on how complicated things are, potentially one or two other uh, sub leaders. And um, the National Aries Organization has taken a very important step. In, in the ICS world, you prove that you're qualified to fill a particular role by completing what's called a position task book. And the position task book uh, is composed of uh, training, of activities, experience that you gain, uh, of um, practical or oral examination, uh, there are a lot of things that can go into this, but at the end of the day, you get your position task book signed off by somebody who's authorized to do that, to sign off that for that position. And now that says to any agency operating under ICS that you are qualified to perform the, the tasks that are associated with that particular role. And you can walk in, you carry all your PTVs around with you and you can walk in and they can look at your PTV and they can see, yep, you can do Oxcom. You know this stuff. Um, so uh, the National Aries folks have developed a position task book for Aries. And uh, everybody who volunteers for Aries is expected to complete it. There are three levels. The first level is 
a no-brainer. O means optional, R means require. So be, to be level one ARIES certified, you have to get a copy of your task book and you have to join an ARIES group. And now you're at level one. Uh, the expectation is that most people will get to level two. Level two, uh, now some of the optional stuff has become required. There's a set of three or four online intro to NIMS and ICS courses that FEMA provides, and, uh, and you can go through them an hour each. We're supposed to do them every two or three years, I think, uh, because they do change from time to time. Uh, so those become required. Uh, the ARRL does a uh, intro to com emergency communications. It used to be, um, it was a, a, when I did it, probably when you did it, it was a remote course. You were assigned a mentor, you did phone calls, they gave you homework. Now it's all online. It's a, it's a self-paced kind of thing like the others. <clears throat> and, um, and then you're required to, to prove that you can program your HT and you know what an ICS 213 form is, which is the kind of the ICS version of the ARRL radiogram. Um, so fairly minimal. And level two is considered to be enough to, uh, for example, uh, the, the plan is if you're level two, you'll be able to staff an EOC ham radio station, for example, something like that. Um, I don't know what the plan. Are you still involved in the state EOC crowd? What's uh, are you all going to have to be level two, or you have to be Oxcom that to right to get now, in there? Right now, uh, that's the goal. Uh, Dave has gotten has gotten uh, supported in the right direction. Good. Uh, we've been we've been we have to stand down about two years ago uh, because someone got injured on property. Yeah. Uh, So things are happening. I would say it, within a year, we'll probably get to it. Um, in fact, next month I go up for uh, Oxcom C uh, training up in November. Oh, you're doing the, the Comex in November? If I pass the quiz, Roger. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't taken mine yet either. Uh, Gabe and the uh, EC for Fairfax, who is also the Oxcom liaison between the feds and Virginia, have uh, put together now two uh, Oxcom courses, which is the first requirement for Oxcom. You have to go through a two and a half day course. And then uh, there, there's a whole bunch of practical stuff that you have to do that uh, if, if you have, if it works out well, you can do it by participating in local exercises. If you have somebody local who can sign off, but uh, but nobody does, nobody can in Virginia. So uh, Gabe and uh, Brendan have arranged a, a two and a half day exercise up in Northern Virginia uh, in November. And those of us who have been through these two Oxcom classes are going to go up and theoretically walk out with our books signed and As be I, real and Oxy. If this beta training works to get the people uh, that go to this class to see it, what additional would be needed so you could sign off on a task order, so yeah. back to your area, and then right. eventually train the trainer. Right. Operation. So I volunteered to, to try to get certified as a trainer. And right now, if we want to have an Oxcom class in Virginia, we've got to bring people in from out of state. We have nobody in state who can teach the class. So part of the goal is to get a cadre of a dozen or so of us who can teach the class so we can offer it regularly instead of once every three years. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, so level three, Aries level three, I got a little ahead of myself. Aries level three is, is uh, for leadership. If you're uh, an EC like me, 
uh, or one of the uh, assistant DCs or a section emergency coordinator, all of those sorts of leadership roles, you're supposed to be at level three. This is my PTB. Uh, I'm not there yet. These courses, all of these things, each of these is a couple of hours online. So I'm, I've, I've got, I think three of them done now. I'm plugging through them one or, one or two a week. Um, more of that, more, uh, more proficiency stuff. And then the, uh, then the Oxcom position task book is, is much more, uh, much more in depth. It's 22 pages, a lot of practical stuff. Uh, lots of, uh, okay, show me how to do this, how you would do this. Uh, show me how you fill out this form. Show you, what do you do in this situation? A lot of oral exam kind of stuff that's gonna happen up in, in Northern Virginia in a few weeks. Um, so uh, what are we doing around here? So that's the boring bureaucratic part. I wanna talk a little bit about, about what we're doing here. I already talked about the new leadership and, uh, and having Gabe at, uh, at VDEM is a, is a, a huge thing, uh, really, really big. So we are uh, going through the process of getting our position task, Aries position task books uh, worked up and signed. Uh, now that I'm signed off at level two, I can sign other people's task books at level two. So we can do that locally. We don't have to go uh, outside. I had to get Jack to sign mine. Um, and uh, we've been exercising pretty heavily. Uh, if you count WinLink Wednesday, and we added something that we call Mesh Wednesday, so we we exercise our mesh networking capabilities on Wednesday as well. Uh, if you add that all together, it comes out to seven or eight exercises a month. Uh, we do two Saturdays a month. We have a training session on uh, Wednesday evening every month, plus these regular things that happen every week on Wednesday. So uh, we're, we're everybody's putting a lot of time and energy into this. I'm really impressed what people have been able to do. Yeah, Dave, Joe, there's Joe. Dave, other Dave. Uh, Carolyn's an honorary member. <laughs> John, <laughs> she has to listen to it all the time, so. Um, uh, uh, Greg N4, uh, Greg. N4PGS, um, who am I missing? I think that's it. Hmm? Hmm. No, he hasn't been participating. I think that's it. There's I, six or seven of us. Thanks. Um, we're planning on doing some recruiting. In fact, Dave and I are going to go, uh, uh, put on our pretty new Oxcom shirts and go down to uh, one of these community meet and greet things that the county holds every once in a while. We're going to one in Scottsville in a week and a half, I think, and set up a tent and try to get some people interested in this. And we're changing our approach. We've always recruited from ham radio. We've, we've tried to take hams and turn them into emergency communicators. We're gonna go the other way around. Now we're gonna try to find people who are interested in uh, emergency management and emergency response, we can make them hams. I mean, you all know how tough the tech exam is. I tell students at UVA, if you know Ohm's law and you can convert from a frequency to a wavelength and you can measure, memorize a few regulations, you can pass the tech exam. In fact, most of the engineering students I work with all the time could pass it cold. Uh, so that's not a big deal. We can turn people into hams. Um, so we've been building a bunch of infrastructure as well. Uh, we've got uh, now all of us, everybody I mentioned uh, has portable uh, VHF, UHF, HF capabilities, uh, both voice and WinLink digital capabilities. And we've been playing with some other digital modes as well. Uh, we've all got, we've made ourselves NVIS antennas so we can communicate pretty effectively locally. Uh, we we frequently get into debates about whether it's NVIS or ground wave, and we have a lot of fun with that. But anyway, we can communicate locally. Uh, we all do WinLink. We've got a couple of, Dave and I have both built uh, portable WinLink gateways, so we can deploy a, a WinLink gateway if we need to for a particular exercise or incident. Uh, we built uh, the beginnings of a mesh network, and we've got a commitment to put another mesh node at Buck's Elbow on the new county tower. We just have to come up with money. 
and uh, but we've got the got a commitment from the county for a mesh node there, and and that will really make the mesh network useful. That's a, a site that will provide really good coverage for a large portion of the county. Um, we've got uh, a, a network in a box, uh, what's called an incident area network. It's a Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, uplink very, via whatever, you, whatever we can find, somebody's Wi-Fi we can freeload on, uh, LTE modem, whatever we can get our hands on, uh, and then stand up a, a um, a Wi-Fi hotspot at an incident site, which is something that the ECC folks don't have. And they're happy we have it. Uh, we've been working with video over the uh, over the, the mesh network. We've got a bunch of file sharing stuff. Uh, some of us uh, got trained on using the trunk radio system. And in fact, for the first anniversary of the Unite the Right, uh, half a dozen or so of us actually uh, were issued radios and, and we shadowed some of the leadership uh, and provided radio communications for those folks using the 800 megahertz system. And obviously we're queuing to the new standards for training and certification. And the other big change, uh, back in July, we formed a, a new non, not-for-profit corporation and we got our blessing from the IRS so fast that it made my head spin, I think six weeks. And they said, yes, you look not-for-profit to me. Uh, so we are a not-for-profit foundation. Uh, and our purpose is to, uh, to create auxiliary communicators. Uh, that's the number one purpose. It also gives us a, a, a place to uh, hold infrastructure. So we've got an increasing amount of infrastructure and it would be nice to have a, a formal organization to actually own that stuff. Um, it lets us enter into MOUs around a lot of these things with various organizations. And uh, in many ways, most importantly, it allows us to apply for grants. An awful lot of the Homeland Security kinds of grants uh, can't be given to individuals or informal groups. You have to have an actual corporate entity to receive the money. And, uh, and if you don't, you can't participate. So we can do that now too. And, uh, and we've been pulled into the, the sort of core group that's building the OxCom infrastructure for the whole state. So uh, we're in a really good place with that. And we're recruiting. What happens next? Recruitment. So we, we want people, we want people who are willing to make a commitment, who understand that this isn't just playing around, that uh, someday we're gonna be called on and it's gonna be serious business and we have to be ready. Um, and we're, frankly, we're working on local engagement. Uh, the, the ECC folks, we, we deal mostly with the ECC, work through the ECC for everything else. And, um, and, and they're on board with this. They know what we're up to, uh, they like it, uh, but they've been so short staffed through the pandemic that we literally haven't been able to get a meeting with uh, Sonny, the director of the ECC, to sit down and talk about how we integrate what we're doing into what they do. Uh, we just haven't, it's just logistics. It's not a question of support. We just haven't been able to pull it, pull it together, but that will happen. I'm hoping that we're going to be right next to the ECC folks at this thing in a week and a half. And <laughs> we may do it then. We'll, we'll just go to their tent or they can come to our tent. We'll talk. So that's what I had about that. Any questions or, uh, you know, rocks you want to throw at me or whatever? Well, there's a throw in a comment that I was listening to the radio the other day. And there was somebody from Florida and they said, it was so bad, we lost all our power, we lost all our communications, only the ham radio operators in our territory allowed. So despite the fact that there's layer after layer of cell phones and everything else, sometimes everything else fails. It yeah. still can happen. It's, yeah. it, it, probably, it probably shouldn't happen, but it's exactly the uh, yeah. exactly and it doesn't happen as often as it did before, particularly the public safety systems don't fail as often as they used to because they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, hardening those systems. But yeah, what happens in, in something like the hurricane in Florida, everybody's mom picks up their cell phone and tries to find out if their kid's okay. Well, there goes the cell network. Just 
right, right off the bat. So uh, yeah, we're still needed. Yeah, Bob. Are you reaching out into the Canada and Green? Uh, no, we haven't done that. They nominally have Aries units of their own, and we're not, trying not to go poaching. Um, but we have done some joint exercises with yeah. the, the folks. Uh, thanks to K4 yeah. UEK, there uh, we put together right. a nice, uh, nice couple of exercises using cross band repeats yeah. to span the mountain and do some testing there. So I can I can see a world in which the neighboring counties decide decide they don't want to do what we've done and form a corporation and go down that path, and we might decide to cooperate on that. We're certainly open to it. But everything's pretty much in a state of flux right now. And I don't know if, if I know Louisa used to have uh, an Aries group. I, I haven't heard anything from them for a long time. Uh, I know Manny and the Flu, Fluvanna guys are still there. Um, Green County has come back to life. Uh, they've got a new EC who uh, is a retired uh, public safety guy and uh, really knows what he's doing. And he's really lit, lit a fire under the Aries group in Green. Uh, and we've been working with them a lot. In fact, he's Dave and I and Steve Bowman are the three directors of Albemarle Oxcom. So he's he's helping us out with that. Anybody else? We'll talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I, I, I actually messed up. I should have put on one of those slides. We also have a lot of fun, but what we're doing is actually fun. Uh, so you can be serious about it and have fun at the same time. All right. Well, if there are no more questions about that, then we'll talk about something that's just fun and not bureaucracy. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody needs to take a bio break or anything. Wander up and take a look at some of these books available. Feel free to do 